Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, for being here, to those who are here and to those who are watching us uh, online. Um, my name is Nuno Cernadas. I'm a pianist and a researcher, PhD candidate here at the conservatory and at the, the VUB. And I'm working on the piano sonatas of Alexander Skriabin. Um, I would like to begin. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the sixth piano sonata, Opus 62. And I would like to begin by playing you uh, an excerpt from the most significant and large scale of uh, Scriabin's late works, the Prometheus Opus 60, the poem of fire. And on the, on the left uh, panel, So on the left panel, you will see the two piano reduction of, of the piece. And on the little panel on the right, you will see the chord from which all melodic and harmonic uh, content originates. Uh, with this excerpt of the beginning of Prometheus, uh, we can see clearly that this wonderful piece is written by resorting to one kind of harmonic construct, a set of six tones built in quartal structure, which came to be known as the mystic chord. There is this chord that we have here on C in this case. And from which you can unfold the scale. Besides being an extraordinary musical achievement, Prometheus is also a first attempt, attempt at a synthetic multimedia work, as Kriavin included in its orchestral score a part for light organ, which associates to each tonal center a corresponding hue, which in its turn symbolizes an abstract idea or state of being. There is therefore a threefold association, harmony, color, and idea. The example you see here is on display at the Skriabin Museum in Moscow and is said to have been designed by the composer itself, himself. Sorry. The mystic chord, so prevalent in Prometheus, is in fact so uniquely sounding and so representative of Skriabin's idiomatic mysticism that is offered, often considered to be the single harmonic structure present in Scriabin's late post-Promethean music. Although his late music is permeated by the same thick mystic haze by a sense of timelessness and otherworldliness, the supposition of the omniprevalence of the mystic chord 
as I have grown to believe and have tried to demonstrate in our research days, is a mere fallacy. Before I had started to play and carefully analyze the late piano sonatas, I had naively accepted this view, which I had read countless times in program notes. I had therefore based my PhD project on devising a plan to identify the underlying mystic chords present in the post-Promethean piano sonatas and producing a light component by the same principles of harmony to color correlation. Thankfully, and although my initial proposition proved to be heading in a wrong direction, Scriabin's music provided the solution for my initial doctoral ideas to find validity, as I will later explain. When one looks at Scriabin's life and oeuvre, when one considers the total arch of his creations, an organic and constant evolution becomes evident. This steady mutation bridges a tremendous musical chasm between his early highly Chopinesque phase and his final sketches for L'Acte Préalable, in which 12 tone chords can be found. Scriabin's harmonic language evolved constantly with noticeable small developments between works separated by small differences in opus number. A transformation of this magnitude is not explained by schematic and artificial intellectual impositions as to how to write creative and original music, but is instead a product and consequence of a wild independent creative spirit, always daring, always searching, always striving towards a high ideal. The Piano Sonata Number no. 6 is a prime example of this ever-searching attitude. The somber, dark, and unholy atmosphere of this piece is vividly illustrated in Fabian Bauer's biography of Scriabin. The sixth sonata, Opus 62, is a nether star. Its dark and evil aspects embrace horror, terror, and the omnipresent unknown. Only my music expresses the inexpressible, Scriabin boasted, and called the sixth sweet and harsh harmonies, nightmarish, Polygynous, murky, dark and hidden, unclean, mischievous. The sixth sonata was completed in 1911, one year after Prometheus, and in contrast to the fifth sonata, which draws immensely from the same musical and poetic program as Poem de l'Extase, written at about the same time, the sixth sonata has much weaker ties to Prometheus. In fact, their harmonic nature is quite different. Instead of the all-pervasive mystic chord, the sixth sonata uses the octatonic scale as its main building block. Out of the sonata's 386 bars, 227, or 59% of the whole piece, consists of pure octatonic writing, passages which don't include any foreign non-octatonic notes. The octatonic scale, as we know it, is a highly symmetrical construct of eight notes. By alternating a semitone and a whole tone, it creates a symmetry note at every minor third, highlighted in red, which in turn dictates that it will only be able to offer three different collections, three different possible transpositions. The octatonic scale itself was at the time of Scriabin no novelty. It had been used profusely in f Russian folk music, also by Rimsky-Korsakov, and had been also used by Liszt, among other composers of the Romantic generation. Messiaen later listed it as the second mode in his mode à transposition limitée. Liszt, for example, uses the octatonic scale in the beginning of his Petrarca sonnet number 104 as a means similar to his use of the diminished seventh of preluding without setting a clear tonality right from the start. why the G-sharp octave, which is highlighted in red, sounds so radiant and especially meaningful, 
is that it is the first non-octatonic note of the piece, the first note to come out to free itself from the octatonic grasp and to lead the way to establishing a feeling of tonal rootedness. Notice also how Liszt, like Scriabin would do later with the sixth sonata, doesn't write any key at the beginning of the piece, only introducing the E major marking on bar five. What in Scriabin's case is quite outstanding is the ability not only to use the octatonic scale for such intricate introduction or transition passages like Liszt, but to create a complete big scale work almost exclusively out of this language with coherent and meaningful motives, themes, progressions, and logical development. The octatonic scale is in many respects a perfect fit for Scriabin by virtue of its symmetry and consequence, consequent loss of hierarchical and gravitational pull between the notes, characteristics which are inherent to its structure, the octatonic scale makes possible for a kind of musical kaleidoscope, for a weightless and timeless music that fits perfectly with Scriabin's mysticism and his compositional practice of repeating the same elements almost verbatim in transposed forms. The octatonic scale adds a problematic dimension, however, by being symmetrical, by dividing the octave in four equal minor thirds, any kind of hierarchy is removed, any kind of gravitational pull is lost, musical anchoring is rendered impossible. Moreover, the fact that it allows for only three transpositions results in a sound that struggles not to become monotonous. These qualities of the octatonic scale caused a dilemma in my personal case, since my PhD project aimed to identify tonal hierarchies within the Scriabin late sonatas in order to associate colors to them by applying the same synesthetic ideas Scriabin had put forth in Prometheus. But how can one associate colors to tonal centers when there are none? When all of those hearable semitone inflections are nothing, nothing but sides of a symmetrical kaleidoscope? when all different sets can be reduced to three transpositions. These questions, which troubled me for some time, are thankfully answered by Scriabin's music, if one examines it and closely and attentively. Being a scale with eight tones, the octatonic scale is necessarily notated with one repeated pitch, which is then written with different accidentals, which you see here, the E flat and the E natural. The notable aspect here is that Scriabin const consistently repeats the third pitch of the scale, alluding to the usual orthography of minor major scales. This observation is corroborated by the disposition of supporting chords and bass notes, which more often than not feature the root tone of the scale. By clearly showing us the third and fourth step of the scale, Scriabin transforms a symmetric octatonic collection into an asymmetrical one, endowing it with a tonal hierarchy. This differentiating attitude towards the octatonic allows the performer or analyst to trace the harmonic progressions and overall harmonic movements of the piece to particular keys or reference, to use a better term, even if many of these only differ differ in their abstract spelling and not in the sound being produced or heard. This attitude of clear attention to musical gesture, structure, and architecture is one of the more important aspects of the late Scriabin, a genius of both spontaneity and calculation. Since Scriabin's octatonic scales can be identified and traced to one root note, colors can be associated with them as by the composer's indication in Prometheus. Let's now observe the workings of the sixth sonata to see how Scriabin uses the octatonic framework.
there are many relevant elements in this opening sonata theme. Condensed in the lower piano register, Scriabin writes a chord of stacked fifths. These intervals create a kind of detached sound by widening the spaces between the notes and weakening the gravitational pull between them. So the first chord, which you can see here, Extraneous to this intervallic logic is the F of the left hand, which is acting as a chordal pivot and replaces the E with which the chord would otherwise be formed. This chordal disposition is responsible for creating the mysterious and strange atmosphere, which is made sinister by the register and menacing by the affirmative mezzo forte initial dynamic. If we combine all of the notes of the first eight bars, we have a full octatonic series on G. Only one tone, an E, is missing from the set. We also have one foreign or passing note, the A of the baritone voice in bars two and five, which are I highlighted with the red arrows, which resolve chromatically to a G. Note that this is no ordinary foreign note, however, but the only tone pertaining to the mystic chord which doesn't belong also to the octatonic scale. An octatonic progression is triggered in bar nine and 10 by melodic intervals of minor thirds and harmonic jumps of a tritone. Only here do we first leave the initial octatonic referent on G. We reach a second thematic area in bar 11, where we have a full octatonic scale in D flat. Notice the F and F flat being simultaneously played in bar 12, highlighted by the arrows, and the passing note E flat, which again is a mystic chord note. These two examples show us how, how octatonicism is the main structure at play with occasional hints and inclusions of the mystic chord note not contained in this set. Another good example of the sonata's architecture is the tumultuous dance of bars 92 to 101. This passage belongs to the sonata's uh, first big span of pure octatonic writing. The dance consists of an, up of an upward octatonic harmonic movement of minor thirds using the 6Z49 set. This set is a six tone subset of the octatonic scale, which is maximally related with a mystic chord, sharing with it five of its six pitches. It's a bit theoretic uh, explanation, meaning that this set, which is a subtract of the octatonic scale, has five of the six notes of the mystic chord. The sonata scoda, which prolongs the octatonic writing of the recapitulation second and third theme, and thus creates an immense span of 184 bars of pure octatonic writing, offers one more fascinating glimpse into Scriabin's masterly architectural work. On bar 365, in the beginning of a chord cascade supported by a repeated cell in the bass, so here in this place, Scriabin writes a D as the highest note in the first chord. The problem is this note didn't then and does now exist on the piano. So why did Scriabin write it? And mind you, Scriabin was a great pianist. He certainly knew what he was doing. The reasons are again a testament to a structural master plan. By writing the high D, Scriabin adheres to a purely octatonic structure, privileging the coherence and unity of the musical text to the detriment of a hearable result. Had he written a high C instead, the highest possible note on the keyboard, but one which doesn't belong to the octatonic collection on G, Scriabin 
would have allowed for one non-octatonic pitch to intrude into this most pure of octatonic fields. This example gives us a rather rare insight into the intellectual workings of Scriabin and to the intentional degree he attached to structures, relations, and proportions. I would now like to discuss, discuss some aspects which relate to the performance you are about to hear. And I would like first to thank Jin He Zhang for graciously assisting with the triggering and activation of the visual elements, which is not a small feat. As I have previously stated, Scriabin's idiomatic orthography of the octatonic reference allows for an identification of its root tone and consequently for a color to be attributed to each. Thus, we reach the following colors, following Scriabin's Prometheus annotations. C for red and red intense. G, orange. D, yellow. A, green. E, sky blue. B, blue. The referent in F sharp or G flat, bright blue or violet. C sharp or D flat, violet or purple. A flat, violet or lilac. E flat, glint of steel. This is what is written on the score of Prometheus. B flat should be rose. And F should be deep red. The question is then, how do we bring these colors to life? How do we instill in them the creativity and mystery so masterly contained in the music? I try to look for solutions to this most important of questions in the music itself and to let it de determine how the visual component should mani manifest itself. I decided to attribute to each of the sonata's main themes and important motives a visual theme of their own. In doing so, I try to match what I perceive to be each motif's character concerning the fluidity, movement, gravity, brightness of the music, to use some synesthetic vocabulary, but also to take in close account Scriabin's French annotations, which are incredibly valuable and suggestive. Some themes that I believe are transversal to the whole of the sonata and are unique to the sound world are those of abstraction, kaleidoscope figures, gaseous or fluid dreamlike shapes, and explosive or menacing motives portraying the horror and terror of hidden sinister forces. For the sonata's first theme, I have chosen a kaleidoscopic visual motive given the symmetrical nature of the octatonic scale, but given also the mysterious, strange atmosphere of the beginning. For the second, the sensual movement of an abstract web of lines that intend to portray the activity of the music. For the third, and taking inspiration in Scriabin's annotations Souffle Mysterieux and Onde Caressante, the fluid of a mysterious reflective liquid The fourth, again marked by Scriabin, Le Rêve Prend Forme, a soft moving nubulous shape, indistinct. I won't go into details about all musical motives and their visual counterparts, as I don't want to spoil the simultaneous sonic and visual experience but also because I don't want in any way to direct your attention to certain aspects of the visual motives which would betray my interpretation. Instead, I ask you to let your imagination and creativity guide you 
guide your critical perception between what you see and hear and to let one influence the other. I believe this process of motivic sonic visual correlations provides an interesting experience, not only at the level of an immediate aesthetic pleasure, depending on the observer's assessment of the suitability and compatibility of the pairings, but also on a structural level by further emphasizing, now on a visual plane, the sonata's tapestry of motives and their harmonic design. This becomes, in my opinion, particularly interesting in the sonata's development, when the motives are fragmented and superimposed, and also on the coda, which is composed with very rapid turns of repeated blocks of short motivic material, normally two bars each, which succeed each other in a frantic cosmic dance. I hope you enjoy it and thank you.